waters will be broke before me. Now you shall have to explain your whole life span. What you did in the open and what you conceive. From big to small. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. My dear brothers and sisters, welcome to another episode on the topic of paradise. We discussed everything before paradise of the stage of death and al-barzakh and the day of resurrection as well as the descriptions of the hellfire. And now we are discussing paradise and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect you and I from ever coming near the hellfire and to allow us to enter the highest levels of paradise. We want to continue with our beautiful descriptions of the people of paradise now. So let us talk about some of the deeds of the people of Jannah. Some of the deeds of the people of paradise. The people of paradise are all monotheists. They all believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They did not associate partners with Allah. They did not deny the prophets of Allah. So these people, they will be protected from the hellfire. What are some of their traits? Let's talk about their traits and give some examples. So the believers may earn paradise obviously through the mercy of Allah, one of their key characteristics is their Iman and their Islam, their faith and their submission to Allah. Ya ibadi la khawfun alaykum al wa la antum tahzanun. Allah says, O oh my servants, there's no fear on, you, fear on you on this day, nor shall you grieve. Alladheena amanu bi ayatina wa kanu muslimin. Those who believed in our signs and our verses, and they were Muslim, they submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Udkhulu al jannata antum wa azwajukum tuhbarun. Enter you and your wives therein into paradise. Now, my dear brothers and sisters, if you are sincere to Allah and your Islam is complete, you really submit to Allah, your Iman is complete, you're really faithful to Allah, you're very strong and principled in your faith, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless your life and He will grant you a good ending. He will bless your life and He will grant you a good ending in this world. So for example, we look at the ending of the death of Umar bin Abdul Aziz, rahimahullah, one of the greatest people to walk this earth. His wife Fatima said that when Umar Abdul Aziz was dying, when he had an illness, she said that night he started to shiver so much, it was uncontrollable. And he couldn't sleep, he couldn't fall asleep. So we kept a watch over him and we couldn't sleep either. So in the morning she said, I told one of the servants, stay with the commander of the faithful, stay with him. Stay with him and if he has anything that he needs, then at least you are at hand because they were so tired. So she said we left and we fell into a deep sleep due to the previous night being awake. So they went to sleep and they left the servant with Umar bin Abdul Aziz rahimahullah. And then they said it was well into the daytime they woke up and they went to see Umar and they found the servant was sleeping outside of the house. He's not inside anymore. She woke him up, she said, what are you doing out here? Why are you outside? He responded, Umar told me to leave. He told me, leave me. By Allah, I see something which is neither human nor jinn. He said, leave to the servant, I see something in the room that is not human, nor is it jinn. And then when I came out, I heard him reciting, Tilka darul akhiratu naj'aluha lilladheena la yuriduna uluwan fil ardi wala fasada wal aqibatu lil muttaqeen. That home of the hereafter paradise, we shall assign, we shall give it to those who do not rebel against the truth with pride and oppression in the land, nor do they do mischief by committing crimes. And the good ending is for those who have taqwa. And Umar and Abdul Aziz, they entered the room again and they saw his face was turned and his eyes were closed. He had passed away. This is the good ending. The Prophet ﷺ said, He who dies on something, doing it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will resurrect him in the same state on the Day of Judgment. In the same state before his death. Reported by Al-Hakim and others. Now, you will only die upon the things that you lived upon and you will be resurrected upon what you died upon. So if you want to die, die upon the shahada, you want to die upon the Qur'an, become a person of the shahada. Give for your shahada. What are you giving it? What are the efforts you're presenting to the shahada? Are you just saying it? Or are you praying more often? Are you fasting? Are you remembering Allah? Are you staying away from the sins? What does La ilaha illallah mean to you? So give, and that is what you will have at the time of death. If you give priority to other things, that is what you'll have at the time of death. We spoke about this extensively in a previous episode. Another of the traits of the people of paradise 
is that they were sincere in their devotion to Allah. They were so sincere and they were so devoted. إِلَّا عِبَادَكَ مِنْهُمُ الْمُخْلَصِينَ no, illa ibad Allah al a different verse. But not the chosen servants of Allah. Ulaika lahum rizqum ma'lu. Those are the ones that are protected. They will have a provision that is determined. Fawakiu wahum mukramun fruits and they will be honored. Fi jannatin I'm in the gardens of delight. These are the ones who are devoted to Allah. So be devoted, be principled. When you are devoted to something, you don't waver. When something comes to you to challenge you with your faith, you don't waver. You're devoted. Furthermore, one of the traits of the people of paradise is for the strength of their relationship with Allah and for their longing of Allah and their worship of Him. Verily, those who believe in our verses, when they are reminded of these verses, when they're reminded by them, they fall down in prostration and exalt Allah with praise of their Lord and these people are not arrogant. And then what does Allah say about them? About these people who are devoted to Allah. تَتَجَافَ جُنُوبُهُمْ عَنِ الْمَضَاجِعِ يَدْعُونَ رَبَّهُمْ خَوْفًا وَطَمَعًا وَمِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ They arise from their beds and they supplicate their Lord in fear and in hope and from what we provided them, they spend and they give in charity. Trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He will always be there for you. If you long for Allah in servitude, He will protect you and bless you and He will always be there for you. He will provide for you from sources that you do not expect. My dear brothers and sisters, one of the traits of the people of Jannah is patience. Are you patient? <laughs> Those who are patient and they put their trust only in Allah. When a hardship comes your way, be patient. When people are trying to harm you, whether for being Muslim or for other reasons, be patient. When there's a temptation in front of you and you want to avoid it, you have to be strong and you have to be patient against your desires, against your nafs. When you have to do an ibadah that is difficult, it takes a lot of effort against your nafs, it takes effort, you need to be patient. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us so many reminders to be patient. Inna Allah Allah is with those who are patient. Wasmiru kama sabara ulul azmi min rusul Allah says, be patient. Be patient. Like who? Be patient like the patience of the best of prophets. Who are Ulul Azmi min al-Rusul? Ulul Azmi min al-Rusul are the five greatest messengers, the five greatest prophets. Who are they? Nuh alayhi salam, Noah, Ibrahim alayhi salam, Abraham, Musa alayhi salam, Moses, Isa alayhi salam, Jesus, and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. These five prophets, the, the five greatest prophets. Now, here's the thing. Realistically, are you and I ever going to have patience like them? Because these are prophets. We will never reach their level. But Allah wants us to aim high. When you want to be patient, aim with the greatest type of patience. He gives you the best example from the human beings, the five greatest prophets. So be patient like these five prophets. There's a very interesting and beautiful story from the time of Ben Israel. It's one of the Israeliyat, so it may or may not be authentic. But the lesson behind it is absolutely true. Listen to this beautiful story. One time there was a scholar, or rather a abid, a devout worshiper, but people used to ask him a lot of questions. They used to come to him for fatawa, for masail, for questions. They needed help. So one time his wife passed away and he broke down in tears and he started to become isolated from the people. He started to become isolated from the people. So what happens here? He isolated himself from the people because of how, um, how much he was hurt by this, how much he was in grief. So one of the ladies heard that he was not speaking to anyone in society. He was staying secluded, isolated. So she's one of the wiser, older women. What did she do? She went to the house and she told the guard, I need to speak to him. The guard said, you can't. He's not speaking to anyone. She said he's been doing this for so long. His wife passed away so long ago. It's time for him to come back out to us, to the people. The guard said, if you have a question, I'll take your question. And I'll send it to him, I'll speak to him, and I'll come back and I'll give you the answer. She said, no, this is the type of question I have to ask him that only he can answer. She needs a fatwa, a mas'ala that only he can answer. Eventually, the man, the guard agrees and he says, fine, you can go inside. She goes in to speak to this man, the one who is in grief, the one who is isolated for so long. She says, I have a question for you. He says, yes. She says, I have a neighbor. And she gave me some jewelry to borrow. I borrowed from her some jewelry. I was wearing it for such a long time and I loved it. Now she told me she wants the jewelry back. 
the question I have to ask you is, do I have to give it back to her? It belongs to her. I borrowed it. Now she wants it back. Do I have to give it back to her? The man says, yes, of course. The alim says, of course you have to give it back to her. It belongs to her. The woman responded, the jewelry that she gave me, this jewelry, it was with me for such a long time. It was with me for so long. How can I give it back? I became so attached to it. The alim said, in such a case, you should be even more happy to give it back. Because it was out of her kindness that she allowed you to use it for such a long time. And then the woman heard this and said, may Allah have mercy on you. Why then are you sad? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loaned you something and when he wished, he took it back. What did he loan? The man's spouse, the wife, when she passed away. Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'un. To Allah we belong to him, we shall return. To him is our return. So he took it back from you. He took the, the wife back from you, meaning she passed away. She returned back to Allah. And Allah allowed you to borrow her, to have her for so long. So Allah, when he gives you something for so long and you're attached to it, it's out of his kindness that he allowed you to have it for so long. And so you should be even more grateful. You should be even more grateful. And so the man, when he heard this, he realized his mistake in becoming isolated. And he benefited tremendously and he came back out to the people. So my dear brothers and sisters, when something happens to you, be patient. When something is taken away, be patient. When something is gone, be patient and praise Allah for what you had and praise Allah for what you have. And be patient, be patient, be patient. Some of the people of paradise, their trait, their greatest strength is their steadfastness in their faith. How strong they were in faith. The people, verily, the people who said, Allah is our Lord. Our Lord is only Allah. ثُمَّ And they became firm, they remained firm. فَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَهُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ There is no fear on them, nor shall they grieve. أُولَٰئِكَ أَصْحَابُ الْجَنَّةِ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا جَزَاءً بِمَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ Verily, these are the companions of paradise eternally. And this is a reward for what they used to do. May Allah make us of Ahlul Jannah. In our age, in our times, there are many things that try to pull you away from your faith. You need to be steadfast. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهُ ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا Do you testify, لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا الله? Now be firm. قُلْ آمَنْتُ بِاللَّهِ ثُمَّ اسْتَقِمْ Say, I believe in Allah and, and then be firm. Do not waver in your faith. Do not allow people and corrupt ideologies to give you doubts and to pull you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us for our shortcomings and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us firm in our faith. We're going to take a short break. Insha'Allah ta'ala, when we come back, we're going to mention a very interesting story about a person who was trying to remain steadfast. Stick around, insha'Allah, we'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Scale of justice will be brought before man, before man. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Welcome back from the break. We discussed before the break some of the traits of the people of Jannah. You and I want to be of the people of Jannah. May Allah make us of the people of paradise. We need to know what are some of their specialties, some of their traits. So we mentioned patience, we mentioned devotion, sincerity, a lot of faith. So one of the things we want to talk about is being firm. Being firm, istiqama. الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهُ ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا Do you have istiqama in your life? Are you firm as a Muslim? Or do you shake very easily with your foundation? And if so, what can you do to complete and fix that foundation? I believe in Allah and then be firm. So there's a very beautiful story we want to talk about here. A very interesting and moving story. And it's sad and it also has some bright parts to it. This student, he says, when I was in high school and I was starting college and university, it was then that I was exposed to world philosophies and ideologies other than my own, different than Islam. He's a Muslim student. He said, these thoughts and ideas started creating confusion for me in my faith and doubt in my beliefs. And slowly I started reading more and more and more and realizing how little I knew about my own faith. He said, one day I stopped praying. One day I stopped praying. I was no longer firm in my faith. It took me a few years, but I was finally leaving what I grew up with. He said, I began reading about all the philosophers of the past. Plato and Aristotle and Nietzsche and German philosophy and Greek philosophy, modern philosophy and even Islamic philosophy. He said, after many years of being exposed to many ide ideologies, I started writing a lot of articles. He's still very young. I was writing a lot of articles for world famous newsletters, such as the one that he referred to in his story called Al-Jumhur. 
They used to think I was somebody old, an old man, and that I had so much experience in philosophy. Someone much older than I was at the age of 17. He was only 17 years old. He said, and I had a teacher, may Allah have mercy on him. He was very religious and very intelligent. And he was very, very knowledgeable. He said he was one of the very few people that I could speak to about these philosophies and ideas and my doubts about Islam and Allah. And he was one of the few people that I was intimidated to argue with because he was a professor for over 30 years, a researcher for over 30 years. And although I knew that I had doubts about my faith, if I were to actually stand there and I would try to debate him, if I were to stand there and try to debate him, I would very obviously have no standing whatsoever. I would not be able to do anything due to my young age and limitations in life. Now, as time went on, he said, I started to dive into every topic possible. Everything that interests me from philosophy to astrology to astronomy and physics. Every book that I opened, I would finish it completely to the end. He said, I read so much that I didn't do anything else in those years. I barely did anything else. I began writing more and more articles for more newspapers and newsletters and magazines. They started nicknaming me, although I was anonymous, they started nicknaming me as the liberal philosopher in various regions around the world. He said, I started becoming prideful. I was kind of prideful of who I was, this intellect at a young age, this intellectual. And despite all of that, I was afraid of opening up a single classical book by an actual Muslim intellect about Islam due to my fear that the proofs therein would shake me with what I was doing in my path to rational freedom. So he said, one day, my professor found out that I had stopped praying. Somebody finally found out, and it was his professor of all people. He said he spoke to me very gently but very firmly. And so he asked me, لِمَاذَا لَمْ تَعُدْ Why have you stopped praying? Why don't you go back to the prayer? قُلْتُ وَهَلْ تُغَيِّرُ صَلَاةُ الْعَالَمِ so he responded to the professor and said, has this prayer ever done anything for the world? Prayer hasn't changed the world in any way. He said, and I thought to myself that I was correct on this matter because indeed philosophers have left behind legacies and books and people spoke about them, but the prayer didn't do anything for the world. So how can my professor even respond to me? He looked at me as one would look at the relative of a deceased person with sympathy and sadness in his eyes. And he said something that shook me. He said something that brought me back to humility and reality and something that I would never forget. He said, Naam, you're right. As-salah la tughayyiru al-alam. The prayer doesn't change the world. Walakinna tughayyiruna. It changes us. Fanughayyiru nahlu al-alam. And we, as a result, change the world. The prayer changes us. And we, as a result, change the world. And I remained silent. He said, in that incident, he didn't respond. He said, years passed by. My father used to always turn the lights on for the morning prayer, for the Fajr prayer. My mother would wake us up for the Adhan, even though they knew I no longer prayed. He said, occasionally I went with my father to the masjid to pray a few times to see if anything would change inside of me, to see. But my heart was arrogant. My heart was filled with this arrogance. I felt that the prayer was useless. And this is the arrogance he's referring to. Some people don't realize they have arrogance. So he said, I was wasting my time. I felt like I was wasting my time praying. Because every time I tried again, it wasn't doing anything for me. My intellect was above this prayer. Nothing changed. And that's it. He said, one day I became very, very sick. The doctors, they diagnosed me. They found out you have fatal cancer. And you have nine months to live. And at that point, he was living in the United States, in Tacoma. He says, one day I drove out by myself to the coast of our state of Washington. And I went alone to the beach and I stared out at the vast, beautiful ocean. He has nine months to live. He goes out by himself to the coast. And he's viewing, he's looking at the ocean, the vast, beautiful ocean. What does he say? He says nobody else was there. He said it was me, and it was the vast sky. And it was the gigantic, magnificent ocean in front of me. He said it was me, and it was nature. It was me, and it was life and death. I asked myself, have I changed anything? I'm going to die in nine months. Have I changed anything? Will I ever change anything? And at that moment, I remembered what my, my professor had said years ago. What he had said years ago 
الصلاة لا تغير العالم ولكنها تغيرنا فنغير نحن العالم The prayer does not change the world but the prayer changes us and we as a result change the world He said I started to cry and to cry and to cry The tears came down they covered my entire vision of the magnificent ocean. I felt that I had more tears bottled up inside of me than the ocean of water at that moment. I took my phone out to send my professor a message. And I was in such a hurry to send it that all I wrote was the phrase that he had said years ago without greeting him whatsoever. He responded, Allah has brought you back. Allah has responded to you. Live in peace. Live with happiness. The greatest prayer that I ever prayed was that day at that moment on that coast in front of the magnificent ocean, the creation of Allah. He said, and I knew that day, أن الله حق. And I knew ما معنى الحق, what the truth meant. And I knew that the ultimate meaning, النهائي في السماء لا في الأرض, that it's in the heavens, beyond the heavens, not on earth. And then he said, ولم أمت حتى الآن. And I have not died even till this day. He learned that day that Allah was the truth, that Allah was the reality. He learned that day that what the truth actually meant and the truth that he looked for for so long and the meanings that he wanted and that he couldn't grasp with his limited intellect was in the heavens and not on the earth. And this shook him. He said, and to this day I have not died. Do you know when this was that he wrote this? He said this was 10 years ago. 10 years ago when I was supposed to die. When the doctor said you have nine months to live. And I am still alive. And he is still writing beneficial articles to this day. And he is giving lectures to this day in actually many newspapers in English and in Arabic. My dear brothers and sisters, if you remain true and firm to Allah against the corrupt thoughts and doubts of shaitan, you will be saved. But if you run away from Allah, you have no guarantee. You may end up removing your arrogance along the way. You may end up finding yourself back, turning your heart back to Allah. Or you might likely find that it is extremely difficult. You might end up being so deep in your line of thoughts and your stubbornness and pride that you never turn back to Allah in this life. And when you meet Him in the next life, what will you say to Him? When shaitan comes to you with thoughts to question your faith, seek refuge in Allah from the shaitan and say, I believe in Allah and I will be firm. قُلْ آمَنْتُ بِاللَّهِ ثُمَّ اسْتَقِمْ Of the deeds of the people of paradise is humility. Humility. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِنُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَأَخْبَتُوا إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ أُولَٰئِكَ أَصْحَابُ الْجَنَّةِ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ Indeed, those who believed in Allah and they did righteous deeds and they humbled themselves to Allah, they are the companions of paradise and they will abide therein forever. Some of the ayat discuss the details of the righteous deeds for which a person may enter paradise, such as in the ones in Surah Al-Ra'd. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes their state. أَفَمَنْ يَعْلَمُ أَنَّمَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ مِنْ رَبِّكَ الْحَقُّ كَمَنْ هُوَ أَعْمَى إِنَّمَا يَتَذَكَّرُ أُلُوا الْأَلْبَابِ Is he who knows that which has been revealed to you from your Lord is the truth like the one who is blind? Then only will they be reminded who are people of understanding. الَّذِينَ يُوفُونَ بِعَهْدِ اللَّهِ وَلَا يَنْقُضُونَ الْمِثَاقِ Those who fulfill the covenant of Allah and they do not break the covenant or the contract. One of the traits of the people of Jannah. وَالَّذِينَ يَصِلُونَ مَا أَمَرَ اللَّهُ بِهِ أَنْ يُوصَلَ وَيَخْشَوْنَ رَبَّهُمْ وَيَخَافُونَ سُوَ الْحِسَابِ And these people who join that which Allah has ordered to be joined and they fear their Lord and they are afraid of the evil of their account by abstaining from these sins, these are the people, these are the people who are being described as the people of Jannah. وَالَّذِينَ صَبَرُوا بْتِغَاءَ وَجْهِ رَبِّهِمْ وَأَقَامُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَأَنْفَقُوا مِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ سِرًّا وَعَلَانِيَ سِرًّا وَعَلَانِيَ وَيَدْرَؤُونَ بِالْحَسْنَةِ السَّيِّئَةَ أُولَٰئِكَ لَهُمْ عُقْبَ الدَّارِ These are the people who are patient, seeking Allah, establishing the prayer, spending from what we provided them secretly and publicly. These are the people that will have this good consequence of this home of paradise. What is this good consequence? جَنَّةُ عَدْنٍ يَدْخُلُونَهَا وَمَنْ صَلَحَ مِنْ آبَائِهِمْ وَأَزْوَاجِهِمْ وَذُرِّيَّاتِهِمْ وَالْمَلَائِكَةُ يَدْخُلُونَ عَلَيْهِ مِنْ كُلِّ بَابِ سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ بِمَا صَبَرْتُمْ فَنِعْمَ أُقْبَ الدَّارِ Gardens of which perpetual re residence with those who are righteous of their forefathers, their ancestors, their descendants and their spouses. They will enter therein and the angels will come to them and say, سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ With what you are patient with. Because you are patient. فَنِعْمَ أُقْبَ الدَّارِ This is indeed the best home possible. And of the traits of the people of paradise is the issue of gratitude. Always thanking Allah. And the last thing we will say about this topic of the deeds of the people of Jannah is an example of a man who started to cry after he had surgery on his ears. An 80-year-old man. 
And this story may or may not be true, but look at the beautiful lesson behind it. He starts to cry after the surgery and they tell him, do you want us to give you some kind of you know, scholarship, some kind of help, financial aid, assistance to help you with your payments for this bill? He said, I'm not crying because of this bill. I'm not crying because of this receipt for my surgery. I'm crying because Allah gave me my hearing for 80 years and He never once sent me a bill. Ya Allah, Alhamdulillah ala kulli hal. Alhamdulillah for everything. Hamdan kathiran tayyiban mubarakan fi. Alhamdulillah, 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 daiman abada. All the time. Never stop saying Alhamdulillah. Never stop being grateful to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. And if you want to earn paradise, my dear brothers and sisters, you have to work for paradise. These are the traits of the people of Jannah. These are the things that you want. How can you expect Jannah and not work for it? How can you miss your prayers and have doubts about Allah and expect paradise? How can you disobey Allah and expect Him to reward you with blessings of paradise? Repent to Allah, be firm, and ignore these traps of shaitan. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us and allow us to enter the highest levels of paradise. We will see you next time, inshallah ta'ala, as we continue talking about the beautiful descriptions of paradise. Jazakumullah khaira. Wa sallillahumma ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim. Wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Scale of justice will be broke before man. Now you shall have to explain your whole life span What you did in the open and what you conceive From big to small